for making time for us. Uh, I, I've heard you say, there, there are a number of things here. You have a lot of accomplishments. You had an asteroid named after you. You were named by People Magazine the the sexiest astrophysicist alive. Uh, you you collaborated uh, on a rap album. Uh, what would you say is your the the greatest achievement of your life? Yeah, so I I, I hate to sound um, uh, you know cliche about this, but I think I'm still growing intellectually and emotionally and, and physically. So. Uh, I, there's still many things I want to do before I die, and I would declare that if my greatest achievement were not still ahead of me, then what am I doing? I think all of us in any path of life should be constantly sort of improving your what you know, what you do, how you help others. So I, I would say my greatest achievement is still in front of me. I don't know this sounds cliche, but I really feel that. Okay, but if you didn't have to answer it that way, if, right, uh, right. would it be would, would it be a presidential advisor? <laughs> like, if that wasn't the way you chose to answer that, what would okay, you? Okay, so, so I admitted I was self aware that that was a cliche answer. So if I was going to die tomorrow, how about that? What what was my great achievement? I would say, um, uh, oh. what would it have been? Uh, I, I would when I would say greatest achievement, like my funnest achievement, I would say was recognizing for New Yorkers that the sun sets on the Manhattan street grid twice a year in such a way that makes for spectacular photographic imagery of a sunset. And we, I called it Manhattan Henge, and it comes out twice a year. And, uh, and it's, it's something that I've done where initially when I first told people about, oh, that's weird, oh, that's kind of cool. Now thousands of people pour into the street at sunset on these two pre-advertised days of the year when the sun sets on the Manhattan grid. And with the canyons of the tall buildings and the steel and the glass reflecting the sun, uh, it's a stunning, magnificent thing. And I, I feel good about that, having, having uh, I sort of gifted that. It was always there, but no one stopped to notice it. And so all I did was say, hey, look. And it was simple, but uh, it, it, it changed the lives of many people. I won a fantasy football league. Well, I don't get many opportunities, by the way, to do this, because this man is only a million times, more than a million times smarter than I am, but it's not funnest. Like, funnest, uh... <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> really? Oh, but come on, how many opportunities really? do you get to do that? <laughs> come on, the guy's, really? a, the guy's a genius! <laughs> so, so here's how I look at that, you ready? Um, if I use the word funnest and you didn't know what I was talking about, then I wouldn't actually be communicating. I'd be showing off by inventing a word that no one understood. But funnest, that word kind of really should have been invented long ago. And so that's my vote. You're right. Funnest entering our vocabulary. Uh, what were you like as a kid? Because I was reading Neil deGrasse Tyson with us again. Star Talk season two premieres with an interview with former President Bill Clinton this Sunday, 11 p.m. Eastern, National Geographic Channel. Uh, you were both a nerd and the captain of your wrestling team. So what was your childhood like? Yeah, so that's 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 an interesting point. So I'm card carrying nerd geek from from the beginning. You know, I would you know I'd hang out with my friends and and the winner of any day's contest was who could recite the most digits of pi, right? Or who knew what all the scales were on the slide rule, because that's how old I am, and that's how we all used to roll. So, so I was definitely card carrying, but I was also larger than you know I was bigger than most people in my class. And I was captain of my school's wrestling team. So, yes, I could kick your ass if I had to. But usually I didn't have to. Usually. <laughs> and, and, but I, felt, I saw myself as a protector of other geeks. And in the superhero sense. You know, when you're a kid, there's what superhero do you want to be. My superhero was geek protector world over. If a geek was getting a wedgie by the football coach, or, not the coach, of course, <laughs> the right. football quarterback, if you're getting a wedgie or you're getting abused in some way, I would be there and defend you. And so, so um, yeah, I mean, normally when you think of geeks, you think of people who are physically abused by popular people. But to me, geek is not that. It's what you do intellectually, what you value in your free time. Is it watching reality shows or is it solving the Rubik's Cube? Is it arguing over international geopolitics or is it arguing over whether it's Kirk or Picard or Janeway, right? right, right. So it's just a matter of what you value. And I'm definitely all full card carrying geek. Well, how much better would society be in terms of accomplishment if we didn't waste so much time watching sports? <laughs> no, so you know what I know what sports are. Sports are uh, this is my definition of sport. Sports are what 
are, are what guys use to have a conversation with each other in awkward social moments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's you always have something in common to talk about. And so sports are organizing cultural moments. And I, I, and that's, that's, I don't have a problem with that. But if you're obsessed with it, then, then, yeah, imagine how much time you're spending doing that when you could be sort of learning or becoming enlightened. But in a free country, do what you want. But don't at the end of the day complain that there's something you wanted to know and don't if you spent nine hours watching football on Sunday plus all the pre- and post-game shows. The hell is going on here? Can we play football on Mars or not? That's all I want to <laughs> okay, know. You can. You just need a much bigger stadium. Because <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, people, you'll throw it farther, you'll kick it farther, right. people will leap higher. Really? Uh, so, yeah, you just need a bigger stadium. Yeah. Are you rooting for us to find life on Mars? Oh, totally. I want to find life. If you found life somewhere on someplace other than Earth, that would transform the human condition in ways that perhaps we cannot foresee or imagine. It would transform our culture, our politics, our religion, all the things that kind of require that we are at the top of some totem pole. If we find life of any kind, that would be great, and especially if it has some sentience or some kind of intelligence beyond ours. Man, imagine what that would be like. Maybe Earth is, in fact, some zoo that a higher intelligent being has established. And we think we have free will and we're going around running our lives, but in fact, we're just, we're like ants in an ant farm and they're looking through some clear glass at what we're doing and being entertained by us. What do it's you... what we do with other creatures that are less intelligent than we are. Why wouldn't a more intelligent creature do that with us? But do you believe that's, that's... The kind of those are the kind of thoughts I have. But do you believe that's actually so? Like obviously we can't prove any. But what do you believe? Well, we've got some some credible people thinking about the question. Here's the interesting question. If, if you, uh, and a good friend of mine, uh, 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 a colleague, Max Tegmar, is a, a professor of astronomy up at MIT. He's he's wrote a whole book on this. So imagine. You're looking at a video game, let's say Mario Smash Brothers, right? And you're jumping and you're punching and you're throwing karate kicks and you're being thrown off a cliff, but then you can spin and jump back to the cliff. If you made measurements of what's going on and you're in the game, think of yourself as discovering the laws of physics within the game. And you say, when you jump this high, you take this long to fall, and that is your universe. And everything is described mathematically. Well, it turns out, for what are still mysterious reasons, everything we have observed in this universe can basically be described mathematically. Whoa! Well, why is the universe math? Unless some higher intelligence programmed it that way, to be math, for their entertainment, for whatever. And so the question is, can we test for that? Are we living in a matrix, such as what was portrayed in the film? And there's some tests that have been proposed to explore whether, in fact, this is so. And but, so uh, I wouldn't put it, uh, it's surely a possibility. Because, uh, like I said, that's what we would do with creatures less intelligent than we are. When we put a turtle in a terrarium, and there are rocks and some food that just shows up out of the sky for it, is the turtle saying, gee, I wish I were free in an open field? Or, no, this is my world, and I'm kind of cool. So there I have it. We've completely fooled the turtle, as far as we can judge. But, and but, so why aren't we completely fooled? sitting here on Earth. But you're agnostic. You're, I'm not going to rule out that possibility. You're agnostic, correct? Uh, I'm, I'm a scientist, and, and I think for myself. So that's really all it is. I, I, people say, oh, are you an atheist? Are you really? And, and, and if, if you have to pick a word for me, uh, then I guess agnostic would come closest. But what happens is when people want to find a word label... The reason why they're doing it typically is so that they don't have to have a conversation with you about what you think because the word label comes with the portfolio and the package and the whole platform of what they already presume you're thinking and knowing. And I think our, the human mind and the human beings are more subtle than that and more complex. Certainly I know I am so that if you want to say I am one thing or another, the only word that will actually be accurate on all counts is if you accuse me of being a scientist. That's the only if I will admit to. Okay, fair enough. But let me ask the question a different way again. Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson with us. Star Talk Season 2 premieres with an interview with former President Bill Clinton this Sunday, 11 p.m. Eastern on National Geographic Channel. What is the phenomenon that you have been presented with that has created such awe in you that has brought you closest to saying, 
that is a belief in God. So, so here's the thing. If you, uh, I've been on mountaintops. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's something we don't do as much anymore because computers do the observing and they just beam you the data. So the romance and the, and the ritual of trains, planes, and automobiles going to a mountain and living nocturnally is a, a thing of the past. But I'm old enough to remember when that's what you did when you communed with the cosmos. I would go to the top of a mountain, have control of a telescope, open the dome, observe the universe, get the data, bring it back, and contemplate our presence and the past, present, and future of the universe. So that is, that is what we do as astrophysicists. Now, when I'm on the mountaintop and I'm looking at the universe, yes, I have all these feelings that I know religious people speak of. Uh, you feel the majesty and the glory of the universe and, and all of this, this vocabulary that I know I have in common with someone who might have just had a religious experience. So that's, that has me wondering whether there's a common place in the brain that receives that experience within you. The difference is, if you're a religious person, typically that comes with a whole package of a belief system involved. That, that someone is your savior, or someone is your, you, you pray to them, you worship them, you, you have rituals, and I, I have no such attached rituals associated with observing and basking in the majesty of the universe. It, it doesn't require I believe something in the absence of evidence. Forget and so that's the difference between a personal truth that you have as a religious person, and just if you're otherwise anchored on objective truths, which are truths that would exist no matter your belief system. Forgive me for this, Neil, because I could talk to you for hours. I would love to, but we've got more questions. And can you just answer two questions in 15 seconds or less, even though they're Let's hard? Let's do it. We'll go on lightning round. Go yeah. for it. All right, lightning round. Is Miami ever going to sink? Yes. At the weight we're going, it won't sink. It's that water levels will rise and cover it. Yes. And that's true for most of Florida and other low-lying regions of the world. By the way, if so the interesting thing, as the, if, as the as ice sheets melt, and the water levels rise. An interesting fact is that a, a wealthy person will lose their beach home, but poor people lose their only homes. And if you look at all the coastal countries that would that would uh, uh, succumb to uh, rising water levels. So yes, next question. When? How long for Miami? Oh, for Miami. Oh, uh, so uh, that that's that's model dependent, and depending on how much confidence we have on how quickly will something will occur, that that remains uncertain. And so. Um, there's a difference between the data you have that tell you what is happening versus making accurate predictions about the future, given the complexities of climate models and solar heating and greenhouse gases and the rest of that. So, so I don't have, uh, and you have to check with the climate modelers to check to see what is the precision of those models today versus what it was five or ten years ago. All right, and Neil. So, yeah. Yes or no, I Neil? I can tell you this: that I live I live in Manhattan. And in Lower Manhattan, you know, we, we uh, half of everything I knew in shops I went were underwater after Hurricane Sandy, um, and so uh, we'll just start seeing more of that. Uh, we've destroyed the clocks here. Fifteen seconds or less. Why is dying in a black hole the best way to die? Oh, if you have to pick a way to die, you know, get hit by a bus or die of cancer. No, throw me into a black hole, and I'll take data all the way down as my body gets ripped apart atom by atom by the tidal forces of gravity. Oh, yeah, that would just be a spectacular death. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that should be an option. You know, all these people what? that want to just be right. euthanized or whatever, yeah. uh, just there should be a button in a, in a hospital room that says, cast me into a black hole. Yes. And then and send the data. <laughs> right, and, that and should we'll be death. Some, oh, yes, that should be capital give punishment. apparatus to send data on their way in. Yes, humane capital punishment. Just throw you into a black hole. Thank you, uh, Neil. We really enjoyed that. Okay, guys, anytime. Thank Thanks you, for your Neil. interest. Star okay, Talk, Season 2, premieres with an interview with former President Bill Clinton, 11 p.m. Eastern, National Geographic Channel on Sunday. We crushed the clocks, but, man, that was good. This is the Dan Levertai Show on ESPN Radio. Get to Subway to enjoy two all-time favorite subs, the Sweet Onion Chicken Teriyaki and the Chicken and Bacon Ranch Melt. Subway, eat f This is the Dan Levatar Show on ESPN Radio. 
time for Dan to reluctantly take part in something that Stu Gatch couldn't be happier doing. Oh, the apes are mad, man. The apes are mad that we spent that much time not talking about sports. We've got no time for anything. Tell the people Stu Gatch about DraftKings. DraftKings, 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 DraftKings. It's fantasy football on the man. Play where you want, when you want, with the players you want. That's the beauty of one week fantasy football at DraftKings. And with millions of dollars of prizes being paid out each week, every game's a big game and every play matters. So, first and ten in the first quarter feels more like fourth and goal with one second to go and a long touchdown could mean a lot more than just a victory for your favorite team. It could mean you've just turned your love of football into a life-changing payday. Go to DraftKings.com right now. Use promo code HUDDLE and play for free with your first deposit. DraftKings.com. Promo code HUDDLE. DraftKings, DraftKings, DraftKings. 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 Ha, ha, ha. This is the Dan Levatar Show on ESPN Radio. I'm Andy Katz from ESPN, along with my co-host Rick Klein of ABC News. On the latest edition of Capital Games, we're going to discuss what's next for Colin Kaepernick and his protest. We'll be joined by a former member of the Armed Forces, also a congressman. Go to the ESPN app and click on the headphone icon. The Denver Broncos are going to start a quarterback who has never thrown a pass in the NFL, and yet somehow that is better than if Peyton Manning were their quarterback. Find out more on this week's Hot Takedown, 538's sports podcast. You can subscribe on iTunes or in the Listen tab of your ESPN app.